Okay, well, welcome again. So today we'd like to talk to you about automating your service request catalog deployment utilizing PowerShell and CSV files. My name is Andrew Barton, and I am a service engineer at Microsoft. And I'm Mickey Gousset. I'm a principal <coughs> consultant at Imprint Consulting Group and an application lifecycle management MVP for Microsoft. Okay. So today's objectives that we have for you is we'd like you to understand how we utilize PowerShell and CSV files to deploy the service catalog. We're also going to explain how to uh, perform a disaster recovery uh, restore of the service catalog as well. And uh, we'd like you to kind of understand why we feel this is the preferred method to deploy your service catalogs as well. To give you an idea of, of the service that I run at Microsoft, well, that my team runs at Microsoft, we're part of the Cloud and Data Center Monitoring Organization under the Windows Server and System Center Group. We provide monitoring and management for various business units across Microsoft including Microsoft.com, Windows Update or Managed Update, MSDN and TechNet, to name a few. Now, to give you an idea of our business and how many incident requests we generate per day across those various uh, business units, we have approximately 2,500 incident requests per day from eight different operations manager environments. And we have approximately 7,000 computers in our service manager environment. Each of our business units also generate service requests for us from their end users requesting support. To give you an idea of those numbers, we have about 135 service requests generated per day, 25 of those being portal generated, and about 110 uh, email generated. And we have 15,000 users in our system currently that have submitted service requests to us. That chart there just kind of shows the trend of the last three months about our SRs that we have in the system. OK, so I asked this question before. I'm going to ask it one more time. How many people in here are currently using service requests in Service Manager? Awesome. How many people are using the self-service portal? Sweet. OK. so. Why do you want to use the self-service portal to, say, generate your service request versus, eh, let's people send in an email or, or call in? And part of that is, I mean, we've got five points here. One, first one, structured data input. The, the goal is we can provide the fields that we need. We can make sure that the, the user is entering the information and giving us the information that we need. One of the ways we can do that is through requiring the questions. There are field, you can make fields required or not required. You can make fields read only. So you have the ability to you know, define the form, define the request to where you are gathering the detailed information that you need and getting the stuff that you absolutely have to have to be able to perform the request. If you haven't dealt with service requests and service manager before and building these forms for the portal, the question types, it's not just text fields. I mean, you can do things like you can have date fields, you can you know, have integer fields, you can define reg regular expressions or other ways to, to restrict the information. You can pull information from the CMDB. You can do file attachments. So you, it's, it's pretty powerful the kind of questions that you can ask. And from a question mapping perspective, we got to take that data and we got to actually put that data back in the service request somewhere. So one of the way, there are a couple different ways you can do that from whether you just put it in existing fields or you create your own custom fields for doing that, which we're going to talk about. So there, there's ways you can take that data and put it back where you need it, where then you can automate off of that. And one of the other features that people really don't necessarily talk about but that I kind of like is the ability to do knowledge base articles. The goal there being, as the user goes in to submit their request, hey, we provide them a link of stuff over here which maybe solves their problem, so that's one less request that gets submitted to us. So that's kind of a nice little feature that we have. Now, just to make, put us all on the same page, when we talk, this is the, the self-service portal. And when we talk about service requests in the self-service portal, we've got three layers that we're talking about. All right, the very first layer is, is what just got highlighted in yellow. That's the service categories. Think of that as the top level of organizing your requests. Service categories are also how you can apply security. So you can actually limit who can access what request, requests based off of what groups they're in. So you do have the capability to say, oh, well, only human resources can access the user onboarding. So you've got this top level of service categories. 
And I'm putting these terms out there so as we use them the rest of the presentation, you understand. Underneath the service categories, you have what's called service offerings. Service offerings are just a second level of categorization. Think of them as a folder. That's, what, that's how I think of them. Because inside of each service offering is where you have your request offerings. What's a request offering? That's what people think about when you say a service request. The request offering is the actual form that you fill out. Now notice on the right hand side, we have all these help articles. That's the knowledge base articles that we can expose to people. So when they get in here into the monitoring request section, before they select a request offering, maybe they'll see something on the right here that solves their problem. And finally, if I select a request offering, I actually get the request form that I fill out. So think about it this way. We have the request offering. That's the form you fill out. That request offering is contained in a service offering. A service offering is a folder of request offerings, is the way I like to talk about it. And then your service offerings are contained inside of categories, which categories are just another classification level and a way that you can control who can access those. So request offerings, service offerings, and service categories. Now, how do you go about building these things? Well, out of the box, this is how you do it. So starting, it's a wizard. It walks you through a wizard. And starting at the, at, the, at the back window, you basically define the, the name of the service request. You're going to define the prompt. So you're going to say, I need to gather first name, last name, and department. And then you're going to configure those prompts and say, well, first name needs to definitely be, uh, have this information in it. Department needs to definitely have this information in it. Then you're going to say, OK, take that information that gets filled out, store it here in the service request, associate these knowledge base articles with it, publish it out. This is cool. This is great. It works well, automatically creates, dynamically creates the form for you on the, on the page. And this is how you do it for just one. Thank you, Mickey. Now, what happens if we have over 200 service offerings and over 1,200 request offerings in our system? You got to go through this wizard 1,200 times. OK. Well, that's why we came up with the idea of automating this through PowerShell and CSV files. So as Mickey pointed out, we have the wizards. With PowerShell and CSV, we can bypass the wizards, just fill out the CSV file, and import it into Service Manager. The benefit of this is you get to create your service offerings and request offerings a lot faster than you would through the wizard. You also have the ability to redeploy at will, because you always have those CSV files saved, as long as you don't delete them afterwards. So if you do need to redeploy, it's a matter of just running the PowerShell scripts again and importing that data. This is also useful if you're going from a test environment to a production environment. So instead of creating all your service offerings in a test environment, talking to your business units, you know, making sure everything looks great, and then trying to redo that in a production environment, all you need to do is then just run the PowerShell scripts again and point it towards your production environment. So before we can actually fill out the CSV file and import those through PowerShell, we need to gather some information from the end users, or I apologize, for the, uh, from the business units. So we need to know the maximum number of questions they might have on any given request offering. This isn't a cumulative, as in request offering A has five, request offering B has 10, so 15. It's just the max <clears throat> that one may have. This is actually true whether you're using our PowerShell solution or the built-in wizards. Because what you'll find is that each question on the request offering needs to map back to a property on the service request class. Now, you have a few properties built in that you could utilize, such as your title, description, priority. But if you have many more questions than that, you'll find there's no other uh, or very limited <coughs> excuse me, number of properties you can map back to. <coughs> we also need to know the response of data types. So as Mickey pointed out, you, the, the portal is pretty flexible. You can have date pickers. You can have true, false. You can have lists. So we need an idea of what data types we're going to be creating when we're extending the service request class. And finally, we also need to know the property mappings and data warehouse requirements that your business units might have. For example, in our internal team, we call ourselves monitoring and management, 
Since we support nine different business units across Microsoft, we have a drop-down list on our request offerings that says, what team do you belong to? Initially, when we did the deployment, we were mapping on each request offering, we were mapping that property back to various properties on the service request class. So on request offering number one, it might have mapped back to, say, a string called SR string one. On a request offering number two, it might have mapped back to SR string five. So we weren't consistent across our request offerings. Well, that causes havoc when you're trying to do any reporting on that, because instead of adding your one column to your output, you now have to add you know, multiple columns. That's also true for your views, as well as you, any emails you want to send out. So it's good to know that ahead of time if there's any considerations, considerations such as that, so you can address them ahead of time and not have to go back and fix it later. So we want to talk about extending the service request class. And what does service, extending the service request class mean? Well, that's how we actually add those properties to the service request. So we've gathered the information from the end user. And what we want to do is we want to take the base properties on the service request class, and we want to add to it. That's what extending the class does. And that's when we need to know the number of properties and their types, because of this is where we're going to add those. And just to give you an idea, we have, in our environment, 28 custom enums, or lists, 19 strings, and 8 bools, just to kind of give you an idea. And again, that's across approximately 1,200 request offerings. So now we want to demo extending the service request class. Now, I lost connection to CorpNet, so we'll try to log back in here. Hopefully we did not lose internet, but actually it looks like we might have. We'll see here. Yeah, looks like we lost our internet. So instead, we are going to go through some screenshots of this. Bear with me here for a second. All right, so extending service request class. This is done through the authoring tool. And basically, what the first thing you do is you need to create a new management pack. This is what we're going to store the extensions or the new properties in. Once we have that created, we can go to the class browser within the authoring tool. We'll search for the service request class. And we can right-click on that and click View. From there, back in our Management Pack Explorer, what that did is it opened up the Management Pack that class is stored in. We also have, above that, the custom Management Pack that we just created as well. From there, we can right-click on that, and we can choose Extend Class. And it will prompt us where to save that Management Pack. That's because the service request class extension is in a sealed management pack, so we cannot save it there. It automatically displays the other management pack we have created, and so we save it there. Now, to create the properties on the service request class, there's in the right-hand side there, there's a button called Create Property, and we will create a number of properties. And the, for the purposes of this demo, uh, we would have created three SR string ones, or sorry, SR string one, two, and three. And we like to leave these generic. And the reason why is because we might map back various different questions back to the same properties. So we leave them generic so that you don't have, say, a very specific name for a property you've created that has completely unrelated data stored in it. So the end result is this down uh, at the bottom there where you have the class properties and relationships. We created SR string 1, 2, and 3, SR calendar 1, attachment 1, bool 1, and enum 1. These are just to give you an example of all the different types that you can create. 
Now enums, or lists, they're slightly different in that when we change the data type to the appropriate type, when we created SR enum one that's just the property that your data gets saved to. So once your end user chooses the list item, SR enum one is where it would be saved. We then create an actual list where the choices the end user can choose from are displayed. Once we've done that, we can save this management pack and we can seal it. Now, the reason you want to seal the management pack is because anytime you have one management pack referencing another, it needs to be sealed. So if we were to use our custom properties and add them to some custom views, in order to make that reference, we need to have that management pack saved. We also need to define a key file. Now, a key file is just a private public key pair that just kind of identifies who you are, just so somebody getting your management pack knows it's not malicious. And we define our company, and we can save it. After that, we can import that management pack into Service Manager. And since we have that custom list we created, we can go to the library and lists and fill out those custom list items. Just trying to figure out what slide we were on. There we go. So unfortunately, we couldn't demo that live, but that's kind of where how to uh, extend the service request class. And that's actually important for our, our next steps as well. And we would prepare the, uh, the service catalog for import. So what we would need to do is we actually need to populate the CSV file. Now, the CSV file contains all of the information needed to import your service catalog or to build your service catalog, such as you have your category, your service offering, your request offerings, all the questions. You have your mapping as well. And I pointed out specifically here the question type. Most of the fields within the CSV file are free form. You can call it your category, whatever you want, your service offering, whatever you want. Your question types need to be very specific, and it's what Service Manager uses to know what to prompt the end user with. So a date picker, a true, false, a list. And so that's why I pointed out here separately. Now, we've kind of made it a little more user friendly, whereas Service Manager might look for a string. The script will actually just look for text. Or, for example, date time is what Service Manager would look for. We just called it date. So I just threw this up here for uh, reference purposes. Once we've populated that CSV file, we have three PowerShell scripts that we would run to import this data into Service Manager. We have the convert SO PowerShell script that looks at the CSV file, takes all of the category information, as well as the service offerings and the related data, and it imports them into or it saves them to a management pack and imports that into Service Manager. The next PowerShell script, convert RO, what that does is it looks at the CSV file again, takes the request offerings and all the related data, saves it to the management pack, and imports that into Service Manager as well. Now, the convert RO PowerShell script does do one other thing that's important to point out. It takes from the CSV file, it takes the category, the service offering, and it adds those to the notes field of the request offering. That's important because the link SORO PowerShell script will then look at all request offerings in the system, look at the notes field, and create the relationship from the service offerings to the request offerings. Now, let's just check here and see if we have our, our internet back. And it looks like we do. So bear with me here for one moment. So I want, I want to jump in for a second while he's getting that back up, which I thought this was really cool when, when, when we were talk, first talking about this, because this is also a, a, a way that we found with a customer to do something very similar, which was automate the creation of a ton of service requests by having this CSV file. Another kind of cool thing that we did from an automation perspective was 
we had a customer that wanted to be able to dynamically set who's, um, who the reviewers were or dynamically set the process based off of how the form was filled out. So what we did is we just provided one generic form and they filled that out and then we had an orchestrator run book that on the back end looks, evaluates what was put in that form and then actually creates the service request and puts the appropriate activities in there and dynamically builds out the whole process. So the point of that is there's a lot of ways that you can do this with orchestrator and PowerShell and service manager to really automate pretty much any situation you want. Thank you, Mickey. Now, just in case we did lose internet, I actually created a management pack ahead of time. And so basically I'm going to import it into service manager because the remaining steps also require that that management pack be in the system. So I clicked on the import uh, task under the management packs, and there it goes. So basically, we're looking for a sealed management pack. And I just called it service request extensions. You can really name those whatever you would like, but just you know, so you kind of know what is contained in that management pack. So we will import that. And then we will start with our demo on the uh, CSV file population momentarily here. And I hit the task twice, that's why we got that prompt. And real quick, I'm going to go to library and lists as well, because we'll populate our test list that we created. I just called it SR list one. Something that I wanted to point out here is that uh, once we've created the list, since this was stored in a sealed management pack, when we try to add items to it, it wants to st store them into an unsealed management pack. So it'll actually prompt us to specify the management pack we want to save things to. And what we like to do is we like to store everything, all the lists in, the, in one management pack. That way you can easily export and import that management pack as well. As Soon as it wants to pop up here, we will continue. So once those are stored, oh, here we go. So I'm just going to quickly create a new management pack. We'll just call this lists. Click OK and OK again, and we have our first item. Well, just a few here. And for the purposes of the demo, we're just going to leave everything very generic. So we'll just call this value 1, value 2, and we'll just leave that the same. All right, so we've populated that list. And the reason I went back and did that is because when we demo the final service catalog, we'll need that list populated just to, to show you guys what, what it looks like. So filling out the service, or sorry, the CSV file. It's basically a, a blank Excel spreadsheet with a few headers in there. It's pretty self-explanatory. We have the category, the service offering, some description fields, and all the request offering data. So we'll start off by just doing a, specifying a category. So we'll just call this MMS test. Okay. So we've just created our category, just like that. We'll next define a service offering underneath that category. Uh, for this demo, let's just call this service manager. Okay. Now the SO overview and SO description, those are the overview is a brief description, and the description is a more in-depth description. So let's say use this for all service manager requests. And we'll do a little bit longer description for any issues with service manager. Use this SO to request support. Okay. Now, the SO icon field, it's actually optional, as well as the overview and description. You don't need to add anything. We like to leave the SO icon uh, blank and uh, we just use the default built-in icons, which is just a, a set of keys. So we'll leave that field blank. So we've actually just created our first service offering. So instead of going through the wizard, we just filled out three or four lines, and our service offering is created once we import this into Service Manager. So we'll define our first request offering underneath the Service Manager service offering. And we'll just say, report a problem for our request offering. Again, we'll give it a description. Use this to report a problem with service 
manager. Okay. Now this is where we start to define our questions as well. So one thing we like to do is anytime we have a required field on the service request, we like to have the end user fill that out. That way, once the ticket is submitted, our tier one teams don't have to take the extra time to fill out those required fields. So the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to define a title. Okay. Now, this is what the, the end user is going to be prompted with. It's just going to say title. The answer here, the answer column is only used when we are presenting the end user with a preset list that we want them to choose from. Since this is just going to be a text field, we don't actually need an answer. So we'll skip that one. As Mickey pointed out, we can have required fields if we want. And since title is required on the service request, we'll say yes, this is required. Now our question type, that's where we had that, that chart in the presentation. So in this case, it's just going to be text. That's the type of question. So service manager knows that, hey, I'm going to just present a text box to the end user to fill out. We want to map this back to a property on the service request. And again, since we're mapping it back to title, that's what we're going to put in the map field. Okay. Now, RO owner and RO icon, those are both optional. You might use RO owner in case you support multiple business units. You want to know at a glance, OK, this is who I need to contact for any issues that we need to address with this request offering. We just leave this blank. Okay. So we've just created our first category, service offering and request offering. And we have one question. Okay. So if we want to actually create more questions, we just define our request offering again, report a problem. We do not need the description again. But we'll just go for our second question. So we'll say, please provide details about this request. Okay. That's a pretty important question, so we'll actually have that required as well. And notice, again, I skipped the answer column because this is just going to be freeform text. So that's what the question type is going to be. And we might map this back to one of our custom properties. So I've already used the title. I don't really want to use the description for this one, just my preference. So I will just use our custom one that we created. It was called SR string one. And again, we'll leave RO owner and RO icon blank. Let's create a few more here, just of different types, so we kind of have an idea. Uh, again, we're going to define our request offering. Let's have a title of is this still an issue? We're going to use a bool instead. Okay. So we're going to just say this is not required. Question type in this case is going to be true, false. That's what we, the PowerShell scripts, uh, script looks for and knows that, hey, this is a bool. And we're going to map this back to uh, SR bool one. That's another property that we had created custom. And let's jump into a list here. Lists are a little bit different. So report a problem. Question, since we left this list very generic, we'll just call this something generic as well. Choose a value. This is where we can use the answer column. So if you recall, well, we walked through the screenshots of it. But if you recall that we had created an SR enum one for a property, that's where once they choose an answer, this would be stored. We actually need to present them with the list of answers that they can choose from. That's where we had SR list one. And so that's what we will point or call out here in the answer column. And if you guys have any questions about this, I wrote this up in a blog as well that uh, should help as well. We'll say it's not required, so we'll leave it blank. Our question type is going to be MP enum list. And again, that's so that service manager knows, hey, I need to associate this with an enum list. And we'll map this back to SR enum one. Again, that's where the property, once it's filled in, that's where it gets stored, the question. There's one other type of list. So this list, the enum list is useful for if you need to change this list from time to time. You can go into library lists and then make a change there. 
if we just want to create a list on the fly, we don't want to have to go and create an enum and a list in Service Manager. We can do this on the fly as well. So again, report a problem. We'll have a title of, say, how many users does this affect? Okay. Again, we're going to fill out the answer because this we have items we want to present back to the end user. So we'll just say one to five. Okay. We won't make it required, but the question type in this case is going to be simple list. And that's just telling Service Manager that, hey, this is a list we created on the fly, and so it knows that it needs to populate the question with these answers. Okay. Since this is a list that we've, we're creating on the fly, we don't really have anything to map it back to, so we're just going to map it back to SR string 2. That's another property that we created. Now, if you want to have more options in there to choose from, define the request offering, define the same question, and we'll go for our next answer. We'll say 6 to 10. Again, it's going to be a uh, question type of simple list and map back to the SR string 2 again. Okay? And we'll just do one more here. Report a problem, how many users, and we'll say more than 10. Simple list, SR string two. Again, so when you go to the portal, the end user is going to see this list. They'll have a drop down of three choices one to five, six to 10, or more than 10. So if you want to create different request offerings under the same service offerings, we just uh, call it a different request offering. So we'll just say request functionality. We can give it a description, description here. We'll, again, have the title, because we like to have the title on all of our request offerings. Okay. And we'll make this a required field. It's going to be of type text, and again, it'll map back to title. Now, you know how I said each one needs to map back to a unique field? That's only within a request offering. As soon as we start creating a new request offering, we can reuse those fields again. So let's say we want to create another uh, service offering. We'll call this one Operations Manager. We're still under category MMS test, but we just created a second service offering. We would give it an overview and a description. We'll leave the icon blank, and we'll start on our request offering. Now this is where this comes, uh, the CSV files can be really handy as well. So we might want to have, because Operations Manager and Service Manager can be pretty similar, so we might want to have the same request offering as we had in Service Manager, the uh, service offering, Service Manager. So we can actually just do some copy and paste. We can change words around so it's specific to Operations Manager. But that makes it pretty easy. Now, in the amount of time it took to create the one request offering, we now have two with some minor tweaks. We could actually do this all day long, but we have a pre-populated one that we filled out. It's got about 100 lines in there, so it's got a number of different request offerings. So instead of continuing down this path, we'll go and import that one into Service Manager utilizing PowerShell. So I'm going to go on to my primary Service Manager server, launch PowerShell. Now the PowerShell scripts, they rely on some custom commandlets that members of the product team created. They're called SMLets. That can be downloaded from the CodePlex site, and there's a link at the end of the PowerShell, or sorry, the PowerPoint presentation if you'd like to take a look. So the first thing we're going to do is import that module. So we'll import module, SMLets. It'll take a few moments here to import that module. And the reason we use this is because they have gone a little more in-depth on the ability with these custom commandlets than the built-in ones offer us. And so we took advantage of those when creating these PowerShell command, or scripts. rather. So as soon as that's done, we will uh, run the first PowerShell script. But let's take a look at them first. I just threw them on my desktop. We have the convert RO, convert SO, and link SO RO. I also have the installer here, just in case we're going to a new environment. Notice also we have a CSV folder. That's where we have to have our CSV file. The PowerShell scripts know that that's the path to the CSV file. 
And then we also have our portal images folder. That's if you do have custom icons, that's where those would be loaded. Ours is just empty since we're not using it. Okay. So let's change directories to my desktop and to the folder service catalog scripts. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to run convert so.ps1. And there's a couple of switches we need to add to this. We need to specify the CSV file name. Okay. So we'll add that. And we need to specify either a new or existing management pack name. I like to specify new ones for each of these uh, service catalogs. So we'll just call this MMS test MP. Okay. And we will run that. If all goes according to plan, we won't receive any errors. But along the way, we'll have a few different statuses. Initially, it's making the connection back to Service Manager, and that's what takes the longest time for this demo. Uh, if you have a really long CSV file, that can also take extra time as well. In this case, our CSV file is pretty short, so once it kicks in, it'll go pretty quickly. And we'll see a couple statuses. One will say creating the management pack, and then if we're lucky, we might see a blurb about it creating all the service offerings. We may or may not see that just because it is really short. Oh, there it is. So it's creating the category, and it will also create the service offerings as well. And it imported that management pack into Service Manager. Now the next oops, uh, PowerShell script is the convert RO. Again, we need to add our CSV file name. Now you can specify the same or a different management pack. We like to store all of the service catalog data for each category in the same management pack. That way it's consolidated, it's easy to import and export or delete if you want to remove your whole service catalog. So we'll specify the same uh, management pack. Okay. And then we need actually two additional pieces of data for this uh, PowerShell script. We need to specify a new or existing template. This is the template that would get applied anytime somebody submits a new uh, service request through the portal. So we're going to do a, just a new one here. We'll call this MMS test template. Okay. And then the final thing we need is, since we do have custom properties we've created, we need to tell the PowerShell script what management pack that is stored in. Actually, not the management pack itself. We need to tell the PowerShell script what the class name is that we've created. And uh, this will actually take a few seconds since we did not create this through, uh, through the uh, authoring tool during this demo. So I need to actually open up the one that I had already created to get that information. So we'll open this up. Another way to do this is if we want to just modify the XML directly, we can see the class in there as well. I'm using the authoring tool in this case because chances are you probably still have the authoring tool open with your management pack in there. And so it's a very easy, quick way to reference it as long as it will uh, open up for us. The, the authoring tool for anybody who has used it can be a little bit slow when, when trying to do these, but once you're going in and creating properties and such, it goes a lot faster. So, well, in the meantime, let's see if we can modify this uh, management pack. Let's go to desktop, test management pack. We'll open this with notepad and see if we can find this. Even though we didn't make many changes, the, it still can get convoluted, especially when you're looking at, um, at the data in Notepad. But this right here, class extension underscore uh, GUID, that's the name of our uh, class. Now, since this is also open to the authoring tool, I'll show you where that is, too. So if we expand classes and choose our extension, in the details window, you can see the internal name here as well. So we'll, uh, we'll copy that. Okay. And we will go back to the PowerShell. And we'll paste that in. And then we can run that. Now, this 
demo worries me a little bit just because we did not do the extensions as I had planned to live, but I think that I have created that managed pack correctly, so this should work. You can see the status on the top there where it said creating the request offerings. And see there where it says missing icon 16? That's just because we did not just define an icon. And so it just used the built-in ones, which we'll see momentarily. So fortunately, that went without a hitch. And the last PowerShell script is the link SORO. This one does not have any switches on there. And if you recall, what that does is it goes to each of the request offerings, looks at the notes field, grabs the corresponding service offering, and creates a relationship. And you see all the skipping? That's if either the request offerings and service manager do not have a notes field filled in, or if they do have notes in there and there's no corresponding service offering that can be found. That's when it says skipping. These should all just be the built-in ones in our case that it's skipping. So we did the link SORO. So if we want to look at the end results, let me launch our portal. This is a test portal that we uh, deployed while it loads here. So prior to deploying this just now, we did not have any data on the portal. And we should have one category with a number of different service offerings that we can take a look at. There we go. Okay. And we'll just drill into one here just to kind of show you the result. So report a problem. It's going a little slow here, but it'll make it eventually. And we'll just choose the service manager request offering. And we'll go to the form. And you can see all of our fields we've created. So we have our title, which is required. That's why it's in red. We have a sample drop-down list that we created. This was a, a simple list we created on the fly. We have another question, repro steps. So we want to get to the next page here. We have a, a date picker. And this is actually what your bools look like. The true false, all it is is a checkbox that it presents, with, presents you with. Now this is the values that we populated in that SR list. If you recall, we went into Service Manager to Library and Lists and populated that. So that's the enum list that we populated. Okay. And you can add an attachment if you want. And then you can submit your ticket. So that was our, our importing the CSV file and also populating it. So if you recall, we filled out our category, service offerings, descriptions, request offerings, and your questions, and import of those into Service Manager. So let's talk a bit about what happens during a disaster recovery. Hopefully you've exported your management packs on a regular basis just to make sure you have the latest updates. Now if you are to deploy these to a new system, you're presented with a problem. When you try to import it as is, you'll get an error similar to the following. And it says invalid enumeration mapping. Now, if you recall, when we created our management packs, the convert SO PowerShell script takes the service offerings and the request offering, or I'm sorry, the service offerings and the catalog, and it stores it in the same management pack. When you're importing into a new system, you don't have that category pre-created. It's trying to create it at the same time as the service offerings. The service offerings don't know, or since they're referencing that, service manager doesn't know where to find that category because it's not in the system already. So that's what the problem is. So you can see here in the screenshot, I've highlighted the category. It's called, in this case, Tech Ready Test. And then I've highlighted the, uh, the service offerings that reference the category <coughs> excuse me, in each of those uh, service offerings. Those are all stored in the same management pack. So what the solution is, is changing the category to the only built-in one that comes with Service Manager. And that's just called the general category. So when you're exporting these management packs, make a copy of it, because we're going to modify one. And we're going to change the uh, category that it references to just being the general one. And the result is you can import your management pack. 
Now you might be wondering, well, hey, now my categories are all general. That's not what I want. So that's why we uh, have a separate copy of this that we did not modify as well. So you take your unmodified management pack, and you can just import it over the old one into the system, and it will succeed in this case because that category is already created. Now, we have a few uh, best practices that we've kind of discovered along the way. I kind of discussed a few of these, but just to reiterate here. Our icons, the reason we usually leave that blank is because there's a, a small problem with the icons that we discovered. When you have as many service offerings and request offerings as we do, what happens is every single request offering and service offering gets loaded to your computer or to the end user's computer when you go to the portal. It also does not cache either. So every single time they go to the portal, it loads everything every time. Well, if you have over 1,000 request offerings, you're loading potentially over 1,000 icons. And that slows down the loading of the portal. It was taking probably 30 to 45 seconds just to load the portal. And so that's why we leave the icons blank. We use the built-in ones. It speeds up the portal dramatically. Now, if you have just a few custom icons, that's probably OK, but just something to keep in mind. We also like to have the title be filled out by the end user. Again, it's a required field in the service request. And so we figure if the end user can fill it out, that saves some time from our Tier 1 team having to go in and fill that out. We also recommend doing just one category per management pack. The way we have these split up is since we support nine business units, each category belongs to one of our business units. And so we can store all data relating to the one business unit in their own management pack. And our other teams then have their own management packs as well. This makes it easy for if they want to totally revamp their service catalog, they can without affecting anybody else. Or if you just need to delete it from the system, say you know, things change, you get reorged, they're no longer utilizing your service, you can just delete that one management pack without affecting anybody else's. Uh, as with all of your custom management packs, we recommend backing those up periodically. Uh, I did write a blog post on backing up your management packs through PowerShell. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, what we've also done, though, is we added a bit to it where it will take and look at the last modified date and only back it up if necessary. So it might be worth checking that one out. And then any name changes, uh, you want to keep in mind, the link SORO PowerShell script, since that looks at your notes field and looks for the service offering and category, and then your, it uh, creates those relationships, if you change any of the names, well, then it won't be able to find the, the relationship from the service offering to the request offering. So if you do change any names, keep that in mind that you might break the future use of the link SORO PowerShell script. That would most likely only affect you during disaster recovery scenarios if you're importing to a new system, but something to keep in mind. There's also some improvements that we would like to see uh, from the product team. Our drop-down list functionality. So while we can have required fields in the portal, the drop-down lists, it's required that one is always selected by default. So even though it's a required field, since one is already selected, it in essence makes it no longer required because it's already filled out. So what we find is that teams will skip over a question because it's pre-populated with a value. So we'd like to see some changes there where it's just selecting a blank value if it's a required field. The page loading is relating directly to the icons. So one possible solution for that is if you don't load all service offerings and all request offerings when you hit the portal, then it won't load all those custom icons. Because we'd like to be able to use them. You know, the, the default of just a pair of keys doesn't make sense for a lot of our uh, service offerings and request offerings. So that's something we'd like to see fixed as well. We'd also like to have subsites for the various different categories. 
So in our environment, since we do have a number of business units we support, some of them are at the bottom of the list when you go to the portal. So when their customers or end users go to the portal, they have to scroll all the way down to find their category. So a request we've had is to have a subsite where they can go directly to the service offerings for that particular category. So it might be SM portal forward slash you know, MSCOM, and you just see the MSCOM service offerings. So that's another bit of improvement uh, that we have requested from the uh, product team. So just uh, in review here, uh, we talked about why the portal is uh, beneficial to use over uh, just your using the wizards. We also talked about how to deploy the service catalog use, utilizing CSV files and PowerShell. Uh, we also mentioned kind of why it's preferred, again, just so you can easily redeploy during a disaster recovery scenario or if you are going, say, from a test environment to a production environment. And then we also talked about how to redeploy during a disaster recovery scenario. So just some related content relating to the presentation. The download site for the SMLITs is posted, as well as the blog post that I wrote on how to deploy using this method. It also has files to download, such as the PowerShell scripts, as well as uh, a blank CSV file and a pre-populated CSV file. And then the blogs.technet.com, that's just the generic site where my team posts our blogs at. And just a reminder to uh, give feedback afterwards. So, but I want to point out a couple of quick things. Obviously, if you've got questions, please come up to the mic. We've got some time because of our network issues earlier, so we'd love to try to answer any questions you have on the presentation. The blog post that, that he referenced earlier, that is a phenomenal blog post. It's got all the details of this talk out there. It's got, it's just, it is great. If you really want to delve into the in depth and how all this, this was actually built and worked, that is a great post to go read. Also, if you've not looked at the SMLets on CodePlex, SMLets.CodePlex.com, some great PowerShell SMLets to really, you know, enhance the functionality of what you can do from, with Service Manager, especially if you like PowerShell. So with that, if you've got any questions, we've got mics here. If you please come, come to the mic and, and we'll see what we can get answered for you. Certainly. So, what you got? Is that mic on? Well, ask away. If we can't hear you, all we'll repeat the question. Why do you need a thousand uh, request offerings? How do your users find the, re the request offerings they're looking for with the thousands? So the question is, why do we need so many request offerings? We have over a thousand of them in our system. And it's partially to do with the number of, of different teams across Microsoft that we support. Uh, we, what we did is we presented them with a CSV file that they populated. And so they kind of defined, here's all the request offerings we, or they want to see. So because we support so many teams, that kind of brings up the number, as well as uh, they get pretty granular on their issues. So for example, you might have a, a site issue on www.microsoft.com. Well, they might have separate subsites as well and call that a separate request offering. So it just slowly kind of started to add up. And uh, some of those 1,000 that we initially had, some of them have since become unpublished. And so they're not all being used right now, but this just uh, over time, just as uh, our service evolved and they decided what they really need and what they don't need um, after their initial deployment, some of those are no longer published. But that's kind of why it just kind of started to add up with the various business units that were utilizing it. Um, I think it's fairly easy. It's, it really depends on the team that, the, that created their own service catalog. Uh, like I said, the, the category that we have for each one, that's just the, the team that kind of owns the service offerings and request offerings. So it really depends on how they have it categorized uh, within each category. Um, I've looked at a few of them. You know, sometimes even I need assistance from teams we support, like uh, on the blogs as well. And, I know I had a pretty easy time going in and finding the proper request offering to submit. Uh, 
So I, I guess it also depends on the user. Um, I, you know, knowing the portal, I found it pretty easy, but we haven't really had much negative feedback on it, aside from, you know, our partners don't want to have to scroll all the way down to find their own categories. But otherwise, we haven't had any feedback saying, you know, it's too hard to use. So I think it's uh, probably fairly simple and straightforward. Yeah, good question. Oh, so, so are you talking about like user roles? So if you can see specific ones. So the question is, how do we uh, filter the categories based on your user roles when you're re-importing? So actually, uh, I have another blog post that I, I wrote on how to copy your user roles over uh, utilizing PowerShell as well. And if, if you follow that blog post and you take your, your service catalogs, you import them into the system first, and then you import your user roles through PowerShell, uh, it'll automatically find that, hey, this uh, user should be scoped down to this particular category, and it'll recreate those relationships, or not relationships, the, uh, the permissions. Now, if you have deployed, if you've imported the user roles first, and then your service catalog, when you've imported the user roles, it says, well, I can't find this, so I'm just gonna skip it. So you'd have to do it in the proper order, but that's, that's how. Uh, yeah, actually, if, uh, oh, so the question was, when we extended the service request class, how does that show up in the console? And I can show you here, as long as the uh, internet's working. I would have showed you when I was doing the demo, but since that didn't really work out. Um, so what we'll do, so, so there's two things you can extend. Well, okay, there's probably more than that, but there's two main things. You have your classes, and you have your forms. And when we extend the class, we're just creating more properties. If you want those properties to show up on the form itself, you would need to do the same thing with the form as well. You can still see them, though. So if we go down to our service requests. So, and to jump in here just for a second while he's pulling sure. it up. So, as was mentioned, you can extend the form. So you can then take the fields and put them directly where you want on the service request form. That is, as I'm sure you're gonna pull up and show, there's also an extensions tab that appears at the top of the service request form. So if you don't want to go through the, 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 you know, go through building out your actual custom form, then you can just reference the extensions tab, and you can see the inf your extended fields on the extensions tab yep. as well. Thank you, Mickey. Now, you can actually hide that extensions tab as well, which is what we usually do. But yeah, that is an option. And as soon as this uh, decides to respond, I will show you. But there, pretty much there's two views, one being the extensions tab, and then also, well, we'll show you the extensions tab first since it popped up. Up here at the top, that's where the extensions are. Okay, how about the other view first? <laughs> so when you, thank you. Okay, so extensions tab, that's where we see those fields that we've created. And you can see the different types that we created for the demo. The other view you can do is if you're in one of the views in themselves and you click on one of the service requests, you get kind of like this quick view of all the data if you scroll down more towards the bottom, this is another location you can see those custom properties that you've added. And again, this is if you have not also extended the form itself. If you extend the form, you can then display them on the form. But yeah, if you don't do that, that's where these show up. Uh, say that one more time. Yes. Um, yeah, it shows up for everybody. Um, you can't hide fields depending on your user. There's no user role that allows you to hide specific fields. Um, we did hide the extensions tab because what we did is we figured, you know, we might just want some back end data that we don't want to expose to the, the end user or to our tier one teams. And so we did hide the extensions tab so that they cannot see those. They would still be able to see it in this view, but usually they'll just open up the form and they'll, they'll see whatever we want them to see. Oh, thank you. Uh, to use which instead of the uh, knowledge articles? Um, the Microsoft Productivity Hub. Um, you know, I don't actually have uh, experience using that. 
But I do know the knowledge articles when you're creating those, and actually that's one thing we don't create through the CSV files. When you are creating those knowledge articles, uh, let's see here, that's under library and knowledge, so you have to create the item in this location first. So if there's a way to just link, like if there's a, a URL that you can link to, it would work that way. I believe you, you create the knowledge article, it links to that, to your, um, to your knowledge article you've created, and it will open it up if it's a URL. If it's not a URL, I don't believe there's any way to, uh, to associate those. Mm -hmm. uh, will that page be skipped? Um, no, it'll still show up, and uh, here's what it will look like. So basically, because the knowledge articles are just kind of along the way, you know, you can look at them if you want. So there's two locations knowledge articles show up. One is after you drill into a service offering, you have your list of request offerings. And then you also have your help articles or your knowledge articles there. So again, this is one that does not have any knowledge articles, so it's just kind of a blank section, but you just continue on to whatever request offering you want. Now the second location for the knowledge articles is just prior to submitting, uh, or to going to the form itself, and that's right here where you have related help articles. And so this page can be pretty useless if you don't have any, but it still shows up. Uh, you can also go to related service offerings. They have a link, so you can pretty much go back a page. Uh, but otherwise, you just go to request offering, or sorry, request form. So if there's none there, you, you do get a page that's pretty blank. But yeah, there's no, no skipping it, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah. How do you handle validation on your text search, for example? Uh, the validation? Yeah. Um, so we didn't. Sure, or like the regular expression that Mickey was talking about. So uh, the question is, how do we handle validation on, on fields that we present? So we didn't develop this with uh, any validation in mind. Um, we don't have any that we are using today in our system. And so we, when we built this, it was just mainly for our, our internal use. So that's not something we developed into it. So if you do have any validation, you would then need to go back into the um, into the console and make those changes. Now, the good news is, is that those are all saved to your management packs. So during a disaster recovery scenario, if you've imported through PowerShell, you can then still you know, save your management pack off, import it into a new system. You'd have your, your regular expressions at that point, and you just run the link SORO to reestablish the relationships. Is it possible to extend uh, the script? Uh, it, it, it likely is. Yeah, it can probably be done. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that we'll, we'll take on, but. A thousand requests is fine, but <laughs> right. you have to set a validation again. Sure, yeah, I un understand. So I I'm sure it can be done. There's probably, you know, the PowerShell commandlets would have to support it, which uh, I'm not sure if they do. I would imagine they do. But yeah, it can probably be done. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so if we wanted to use the service request offering to kick off like a workflow or orchestrator run book, mm -hmm. is there any way of automating that process? Right here. So actually, uh, I had the, the same question. I was in a, a customer call and uh, was mentioning the uh, blog post as well. And they had that same question. Um, and we did not do that. And the reason why is because if you look at the UI, it can get pretty complicated as to what your, you know, what data, data you're giving back to the customer and you know, what items to kick off. And so that's not something that the PowerShell scripts do. It's uh, beyond its capabilities. So I don't, um, I mean, you can, you can try to add it, but I don't, I don't think it's something that would be accomplishable. Yeah, so once, once you extend your uh, service request class or any of the other classes in Service Manager, that data automatically gets into the uh, data warehouse. Um, I believe there's a, a caveat to that. Your text fields, you can um, set a limit to the number of characters they accept. And I believe that, uh, at least with Service Manager 2010, I don't know if they changed it for 2012. If it was over a certain amount of characters, then it would not uh, import into the data warehouse. 
but by default when you're extending them, they don't breach that limit. So yes, they'll automatically show up in your data warehouse. And the other caveat to that is your manager pack has to be sealed. Yes, that your is manager correct. pack's not sealed. It's, it doesn't create the classes and it doesn't create the tables and stuff you need in the data warehouse. So therefore, it's not going to flow over. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So the question is, if you make changes to the CSV file, uh, what do you need to do to get those changes back into the system? So if you make the changes, really all you need to do is you need to just run your, your three PowerShell scripts again, your convert SO, convert RO, and the link SO, RO PowerShell script. Um, what we initially did when making changes to our service catalogs that were already in production Initially, when we would make those changes, we'd make them directly in the console because, you know, they're pretty easy to make once they're already created and the changes were few and far between. We'd also go back to our CSV files and make those changes there just so that we were always up to date. Uh, that can become kind of time consuming because now you have to make the same change two locations and remember to do it. So eventually, um, what we did, that the problem with importing your management packs after uh, like into a, say, a new environment where it gave that error when trying to import. That's why we decided to go and try to figure out what the solution for that error was because we were tired of doing that. And so what, what, we, what we do is when we're making any changes, as long as they're not uh, numerous, as long as we don't have a lot of changes, we'll just make those directly in the, uh, the console itself. If you do have a lot of changes, so sometimes our customers will want to just kind of revamp their entire uh, service catalog. What we'll do is that we'll actually remove their management pack from the system, and we'll just have them refill out the CSV file or, you know, make their changes to the existing CSV file and re-import everything. Yes? So the question is, once you've um, created your, uh, your service catalog within Service Manager, is there a way to export that management pack and repopulate the CSV file? So yes, you can, but it would be a huge pain. Um, I've gone through and pulled list items from management packs and just you know parse the XML and just grab just the list items. You can use um, formulas in Excel to do those things, uh, but it would, it, there's nothing that's out there, to my knowledge, that's been built that would allow you to do that. Um, so if you're up for the challenge, I'm sure you can, but there's, we don't have that capability built into anything today. Right. A manager pack is essentially just an XML file. So you, if you could parse the XML out appropriately, then you could build something like that. Right. But it would be a, that would be a significant undertaking. Yes, that would be. Anybody else? Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Thanks, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Fill out the evals. Enjoy the rest of your conference.